What's up, everybody? Uh, my name is Shaheen. I'm a half of 11, and you're joining me here in my studio, um, a studio that I've just been working on over the last few months. It's almost almost done. Um, and I'm going to walk you through our remix uh, for Artie uh, The Wall, our 2022 remode of this track that just came out on Enhanced. Um, this is one of um, our all-time favorites. <laughs> it's been a record that came out uh, in 2011 and really kind of changed the way I thought about music. You know, it was, it was just, it really paved the path for a lot of the progressive trance um, that we've been writing and uh, producing since. Um, so what I wanted to do is just take some time to walk you through the project and I can show you all the various elements and how we actually mixed and, and mastered. We tend to do a lot of our own masters um, uh, on our own projects and just kind of show you how we made it. So let's start first with the with the drums. I haven't revisited this project since we finished it really. So it's going to be kind of fun rediscovering how I did a lot of this stuff too. Um, so we'll start with the drums. Um, the kick drum here is actually made up of two different layers. We have a top layer, which is kind of punching through everything. Um, that's really just kind of giving it that bite in the high mids and the in the tops. And then we have the low layer, which is really just kind of filling out all the low mids and the sub. Um, I've got a Pultec EQ on it. This is the uh, UAD2 version. Um, so I've been using UAD plugins for quite a while, and you'll probably see a handful of them in this project. Um, so I like to use the Poltec in particular on really low subby stuff uh, or on really high end stuff to kind of give it either boost. So I kind of think of it as like my smiley EQ, which is probably not how a lot of people think of this plugin, but um, that's how I like to use it. Um, so here I'm just kind of adding a little bit more uh, balls as we, as Neil and I like to say, um, around 100 hertz to this sound. But the main thing that really the sound kind of comes together is actually in the group processing. So um, these two layers together sound like this. But there's actually a good deal of stuff happening on a bus that I'm sending those two sounds to. Um, so they're going here to uh, a UAD, and I don't use the 1176 too much, but in this track, I guess I thought it was uh, worth it to kind of give it some bite and have a really fast release. Um, so I'm running it through an 1176. I think really what is huge though is the transient shaping that I'm doing. Um, I've started using the SPL um, transient shaper a lot. Um, this one is through Plugin Alliance. I think there's also uh, a way to get this through UAD. Um, but this is the SPL Transient Designer Plus. So if I take off the transient designer here, <laughs> it's subtle. Um, but it gives it a little bit more bite through the mix. I'm also mixing it in incredibly low. Uh, we're talking like 20% wet. If I was to crank this, you can see it's it's a lot um, and it would eat up a lot of the mix, but this is how we have it. There's a good deal of EQ happening on this bus too. So this, uh, this uh, kick in particular, Often what I try and do is I try and weigh up where the kick sits in relation to some of the other sounds in the mix. So in this case, the bass is probably hitting right around this point, which is why I've actually carved it out. And I've got some dynamic EQ, which is something I've really fallen in love with recently, which I think helps give, um, helps especially with regards to hats and kick drums in the sub low end, a way to have the sound kind of punch through right as the transient hits. Um, which is really big for making big clubby stuff where like every microsecond of of space you can carve out for a sound is really important. So uh, in this case, I've got transient shaping in a way uh, happening via this dynamic EQ. So if I take off this EQ altogether, it's really the low end that you can hear this low end rumble. It's so subtle, but it just adds a little bit more balls to it. Wow, we're talking minutia here. I'm running that through, uh, this is the Wave C6. I don't use this one too often, um, but it's nice when I'm trying to kind of control the overall tonal dynamics of a sound. I also think this is a lot of processing for a kick. We don't tend to do quite this much, um, but this is how it sounds with and without. Again, this is all really subtle stuff um, on the kick, but I think it's really important. The kick to me is like the most important part of your mix. 
Um, and getting that is really important to having everything else gel around it. And in a second, I'll play the kick with the bass line for you, and you'll hear how important it is in this particular track for those two sounds to sit really nice together. Uh, the final thing that I do, and I do this on a lot of our big rumble kicks, um, is I then basically either use Shaper Box or LFO Tool or something like that to trim the tail. Um, I've done this a lot recently, and it's been really important for big, boomy kicks, where which they eat up a ton of the mix. And if I was to take this off, um, it would clash a lot more with the bass that's being sidechained around the kick. So um, I'm trimming the end of this kick, you can see, by what, whatever that is, um, kind of like the last quarter of the kick, so like the last 16th, I guess. Um, and again, it's going to be subtle, but listen to the tail of the kick here. It makes it a lot snappier. Um, so that's the kick drum. Now I'm going to play that for you with the bass because I think that's how it's really important to actually hear it in the context of how those sound together. Um, and this is the kick and the bass playing together here. So for example, if I take off this transient shaping, it sounds, the mix sounds cluttered in the low end to me. It doesn't sound as punchy as it did when I was trimming this last 16th or so. And so there you have it, that's the kick. Um, we. And I don't always do this again, separating kicks out into layers like this, but in the breakdown that we actually have them on a separate channel, um, the kicks are playing a slightly different rhythm. So first of all, that means that my shaper box wouldn't, it, I didn't set it up to be reactive. Um, so that needs tweaking, but it also, we treated it separately. So we have a separate bus for it here, but I don't think it's doing too much. It's really just filtering the sound down. And uh, the filter has automation that kind of opens it up over time. All right, that is the kick drum. Um, I think I'm going to start next with the bass because the bass is really what makes this record. Um, and the bass in the original, the, the groove and the way that... Uh, already made the original track we tried to keep that as intact as possible um meaning we kept his, a lot of his musical idea um, i went through the old project or his old um the remo that he had which is I actually have it all the way up here um i went through this and i actually mapped out a lot of the bass um, myself um, as well as some of the chords uh, and, and the other melodic stuff you hear. So I tried to kind of replicate it. Uh, we didn't have MIDI. We didn't even have vocals. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but we tried to replicate and stay true to a lot of the original while still putting our signature sound on a lot of this. So um, the bass is, the MIDI is taken from what he's done. Um, and uh, yeah, I will show you how we made it. So the the main bass sound there's actually two drops in this record um the first one which is uh very true to the original in terms of what it's playing um is actually made up of four or five different layers but four of those layers are pretty subtle <laughs> um this one layer is called bass main is really the one that's doing the bulk of everything um it's a serum layer and it's taken from a seven skies pack um, I don't know how I landed on the sound. I think I was just probably flicking through presets and found one that I thought sounded nice uh, to start building the song off of. Um, and I have some automation here, which will be really important to showing how this bass sound evolves over the part uh, over the course of the track. Um, so when the track first drops, it sounds like this, and the bass is really heavily filtered down. So this is the sound. 
But what I want you to listen for is that as the sound evolves, it's becoming more and more stereo. And you can see this automation here working. So what that's actually doing is it's bringing in this other oscillator here. So you see the oscillator A is actually just a, it's like a solo, it's a mono layer saw wave. But the second layer is one that has detune and it has two different saws. And so I start automating that sound in. Um, if I was to get rid of this completely, it goes back to being a very mono sound or mostly mono sound. But here it has a lot more width and balls to it. <laughs> um, but funnily enough, one of the things that I try and always think about it in our music, especially is the balance between mid and side, um, mono and side, I mean. Um, and that contrast is what makes something sound really exciting to me. <laughs> it's what makes like a certain drop sound really exciting. Um, you know, if it's very mono and you bring in side elements, it, that contrast is really pleasing to the ear. So if I were to, for example, at the beginning of this track, if we were to just start it off with a lot more side in it, it would sound like this. It sounds a lot less focused because of the detuned sound. But if I take it down, it pulls your attention to the center. And over time, we start bringing that up and bringing in all the side stuff. And then that's when I start introducing other layers. These other layers then complement that side stuff that's going on and just kind of layer onto it and, and make it a fatter sound than just the base uh, this, this serum was to begin with. Um, so this is a track that actually has quite a lot of bass layers for one sound. You know, often we'll have like two or three different bass sounds kind of coming in and going. But in, in this case, you're really just hearing this one idea, but it sounds really fat, right? And so that's because of the layers that make it up and because of the automation and bringing them up. So um, I have a few different layers here and they're all, I think, just layers that I found in various presets that's complemented that bass sound. The bass sound is doing 90% of the work in this track. Um, but there's some other ones. So this is a silent preset. It's just like one of those default artist presets in the Steve Aoki like pack or whatever. But it's a super stereo sound. I'm running it through Decimort, which is a uh, it is a bit crusher and yeah, down sampler that I use a lot. It's really cool. Um, I use this a lot on various sounds, drums in particular, um, vocals sometimes to give them like grit and just dirt and dirty. Yeah, make it really like nasty. Um, so in this case, with and without Decimort. It's much cleaner, and then with it, with it, it kind of hollows out the sound almost. And so that layers with the bass. I'm gonna just loop a section here of these sounds playing, so you can hear them as I as I add them in. So this is the main sound, and then with the Aoki lead, it's, it's very subtle that one. Um, this Hoover sound I think is doing quite a good bit. So this one really actually makes the track or the, the bass feel like it's more than one sound almost. Um, so this is a sound out of Serum, another preset I think I found that I layered. And I've also then layered the Serum effects, which by the way, this is one of my favorite things to do. I love the effects built into Serum. Um, and sometimes you want to use them on stuff that is not Serum. And so you can actually then bring it in. Um, so in this case, I have this effects, which is just giving it, uh, yeah, I'm giving it more stereo width, basically with the hyper dimension and then adding more distortion to it. So that's this sound. I have X for OTT, which probably so many people who are watching this video are, are nerds like me and know and either love or hate this plugin. I'm on the love side of the equation. Uh, to me, if it sounds good, um, that's all that matters. And so uh, I use this on a lot of sounds when I want to give them some life. Um, it is easy to overdo it though. And 16% is actually a lot for me um, on OTT. I like to sprinkle it in. <laughs> um, so I often use it honestly anywhere even from zero to 10%. I don't remember what's on the master chain. We'll go find, in a, find out in a second. Um, but sometimes I throw OTT on the master chain if the balance of the song would benefit from having it on there. So um, often 
in a really light amount. Um, I'm then using the Kilohertz Transient Shaper. This is my other favorite Transient Shaper, and you'll see me use this a lot in uh, our projects. Um, what I really love about this Transient Shaper is this pump knob, which a lot of them don't have. Most of them have attack and sustain knobs, uh, but this pump knob kind of, um, if, I, if I exaggerate it, you'll see what it does. It kind of like pulls down this section right here. You see? Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's one of my uh, favorite uh, plugins to use um, when I want transient shaping. And then I've got EQ. I'm carving out the very top end. This is something I do in a lot of our sounds. I have to roll them off because there's so much high end content there that it just sounds messy. Notched out some frequencies, added some low mid, and then I've added an imager to actually pull in um, some of the overall imaging, which is funny because I widened it earlier. So uh, I don't remember what was going through my head there, but maybe it just sounded good that way. Oftentimes I'll get a sound sounding almost there and then I will just be like, okay, what does it need to actually like pull it in or just make it dialed in? And it's like, oh, it just needs to be a little bit less wide. And instead of going back and maybe reducing some of the width I added, I just kind of threw the ozone imager on there. Um, um, all right, next up we have another uh, serum. Serum has been abused in this project. Um, I love the name of this. Uh, Britannica. That, I think, reminds me of the Austin Mayer Old and Juno track called Britannica. So I wonder if that's where it came from. Um, and this sound by itself is like this. If I remember, this is actually a plucky sound. Yeah. Which Britannica does have plucks. So I think I just pulled the cutoff all the way up, just made it very bright. And as you can see, I'm only bringing in these sounds um, halfway through and I'm actually automating them up in volume as well. Um, and so, um, I'm kind of easing them in. So it just feels like this sound, this bass sound is constantly getting bigger and bigger throughout this first section. Um, so adding in with everything. If I take it off, it's almost like this, um, it's not an octave really, but it feels like it, like it is almost. It feels like it's just adding like this tail and this grit to the sound. So without, actually does quite a lot to build the energy of that sound. And then the final thing I have is I have a serum, but this time it's actually only just doing noise. And so I'm layering this noise in with everything. I mean, again, I automate it up. So this just adds like that last little sparkle of grit to the sound. It's literally just noise. Um, and I think it's got some sort of a flanger on it, maybe. Um, or maybe that's on the overall bus. But altogether, then it sounds like this. Remember, the bass sound by itself was like this. And it starts off like that here. But over time, everything kind of comes in. See, they start filtering in. And it by the end, it sounds really big and fat. Now, the processing on this, there's a good deal. <laughs> um, I have uh, transient shaping on this. Tra on this. Uh, we wanted to make this. This bass almost is like the lead that you hear, right? And so the attack is super uh, pronounced. The sustain is pulled back a bit, so it almost sounds like a lead that's cutting through the mix. Um, I have this kilohertz transient shaper that's bypassed, so obviously didn't uh, use it. I'm trying to make sure. Yeah, I don't think I enabled it. OTT at pretty again pretty extreme for me, 22%. Um, one of the things that's funny about this track is that the kick actually takes up so much of the sub that I was less concerned about what the sub was from the bass. Obviously we want it there. Um, but what mattered more really was like the low end of the, of the kick coming through. That's really the main driver here. Um, next up is one of my favorite plugins is camel crusher. Um, so this is a plugin that I think is now defunct unless you use windows, go windows. Um, and, it makes such a huge difference. I use it on so much stuff. Um, and we'll play with all these on and off in a second. Uh, I'm using the 1176 again here. Um, compression. This is the UAD. 
next up is the black box. I use this on some big buses that we have um, when I really want something that kind of saturates and distorts, but it also compresses things together. It basically glues them together and makes them sound nice and warm and big. Um, I really like the black box. Um, and so I'm using it on the base here. The glue is, man, tried and tested uh, plug-in. If you have Ableton, I think this is kind of built in for you. If not, then Cytomic the Glue, which is an SSL emulator. Um, I still use this to death, in, in addition to the SSL uh, from UAD, but I use this plug-in to death on our stuff, especially on drums. Um, it glues things together. Um, so in this case, I actually have the attack set at 10 milliseconds to allow the attack through um, and a fairly short release. So again, just kind of in making it a very sharp sound. So it is like a lead. Uh, the Poltec that I already showed you once before, um, in this case, it is doing a very light lift in the highs um, around 1.2 dB or something um, over 10 kilohertz. So not very much. Um, the Enigma is, oh man, this is one of the Waves plugins. I don't use too many of them nowadays, but this is one that I use when I want weird flanging sounds. Um, and it goes way back in our productions. Some of our earliest releases have Enigma on them. But in this case, I'm actually automating on an office in effect. So this section here that you hear, the... Uh, and it's off. It's that little flangey thing. I love this Enigma plugin. And you see, I'm actually automating up the density here um, while that's playing. So it kind of goes from dry to more wet. Um, finally, we have an imager. Um, so this, uh, what I, I mean, what I often do is I mono things below a certain frequency. So 115 hertz here. Um, and then I'm pulling in things over in the high end. So in the low mids, I'm letting it stay pretty wide. Uh, but in the higher frequencies, I'm pulling things in. Um, this varies depending on the balance of the track. Um, it's possible that our hats were super wide, the snare is super wide, either the vocals are super wide, and we didn't want it to be super, you know, like the bass also take up the same space. Um, but in this case, I'm pulling in some of the sides um, in, in the higher frequencies or in the high mids and above. Um, this is a plugin that I think a lot of people are familiar with now too. It's called Track Spacer. I use it incredibly subtly. I mean, like that ratio is at 2.8%. Um, it is incredibly low, um, but what it's doing is, in this case, it's moving the bass out of the way of the kick, but it's really subtle. Finally, Endless Smile, which um, often I have it loaded up onto tracks and I don't use it. In this case, I think we use it um, for just an, going into the break, so here. That's the only place I'm using it. Uh, and then finally, we have the side chain. So this is the side chain. Um, I love LFO tool and I love shaper box. And sometimes I use them both. And part of the reason for this is um, I want the top end to often come through more than the low. Uh, you want the low end to be bouncing off the kick drum. So actually I've split this into two bands. Um, you can see there's a there's a low band, which is below everything, like, what is this? Uh, 250 hertz, 260 hertz. And above that, there's actually no sidechain happening via the shaper box. So if I mute this LFO tool, see the top end is not being sidechained at all right now. It's just the lows below 260. But then I have an LFO tool and everything as well, which is actually sidechaining the two of them together. Um, so, Often, especially with big bassy stuff, you're going to want to get the this out of the way of the kick drum, um, and so that's why I sidechain the low. So altogether, now with everything, if I take off these effects first, you can just hear it without. The processing does so much to this sound. Oh god, I have to go turn everything back on manually. It's like this, I believe. That's the filtering. And 
And there you have it. That is the main bass sound, the first bass sound. The second bass sound, we actually have a completely different drop over here. So um, I don't have the synths for this one. And the reason is that Neil, who's the other half of Eleven and I, work on different DAWs. He uses Ableton and I use Cubase, baby. Um, and so what that means is that uh, in some of these projects, uh, Neil actually will work on certain sections of the track and I'll work on certain sections of the track. Um, and so let's go over to this section here, which is the second drop. He worked on this section uh, and I will often then give him feedback on things that I think need to change, but these are the sounds that he sent over. So uh, this second drop sounds like this. Those are the two main elements. And we have these little fills here as well, which I put on a different stem. And here. Um, and so those are the those are the main sounds. Now they are going to a bus again, to this base two bus, which has some processing on it too. So looking at this, um, I have a distressor, which is the UAD distressor. It's one of my favorite, like, go-to Swiss Army knife compressors. Running it through an incredibly subtle OTT. The black box again. Uh, Pro Q. In this case, I'm cutting out some of the lows and the low mids. Um, it may have just been kind of heavy based on what Neil was sending me. Um, I have this notch frequency, which maybe I'm automating it in later. Um, sometimes I will do this to carve out if, for example, a vocal is coming in or something. And halfway through the, the peak section, I might automate this on to make space for the vocal. Um, we have an imager again, which all this is doing is making things really mono in a low space. There's a tiny, tiny bit of pulling in the very top end. And you'll, you know, the sound has like this sizzly top end. Uh, track spacer again. In this case, the track spacer is coming from the kick and also the pluck sound that is right here, the one that's right next to it. Um, so if I go here, um, you can hear it. It's to, it's to make way for that pluck sound so that pluck sound can punch through. Uh, Valhalla Vintage Verb, everyone knows about the Valhalla plugins, they're awesome. We use them a lot for our reverbs. Uh, Vintage Verb, Room, um, two of our favorites. There's Super Massive, which I believe is free as well, which are really great, and they're like 50 bucks, or th I think. Um, so definitely worth it. Um, I would consider checking those out if you want a reverb. And then similar story with the sidechain. Um, I have the Shaper Box and the LFO tool. Um, Again, similar deal. Top end is not being sidechained really, um, additionally, that is, and the low end is, um, and then I have the overall sidechain with everything on top. So um, altogether, it then sounds like this. One thing I do want to mention that I try and do this, and I think I do this in a lot of our songs, is I will then filter the bass down for a section where more stuff comes in. So we bring in lead sounds here in a second, and listen to how I roll off the top out of the bass. If I was to keep that in, It's incredibly subtle, but what it does is it stops some of those very high frequencies uh, from competing now with the vocal that's just come in on top. And so that is the bass. That is the bass. Um, let's next look at the hats and the and the drums. Um, the hats here, I have a Cubase sampler that's pulled up. Um, I don't even know what these hats sounds are. Just sounds that I thought sounded good. Uh, so these are oh, that's from the Matt Zo pack. Just layering some hats here, and then I have a drum loop, which is uh, from Standalone Music, which I believe is Seven Skies' stuff. 
but it's uh, again just a layer to everything. Um, bring in a snare roll here, which really kind of almost doubles as like a hat in a way. And we have these snare hits. So bringing in all these sounds. These clap beat sounds are always uh, a tricky one. I don't use them very often nowadays, but um, in this case, I wanted something to add a bit more atmosphere to the to the section. So it, I layer this on top of all of the drums that are taking place underneath. So if I take it off, it sounds a lot more dry and less atmospheric. If I bring it in, so. That is, uh, again, this is going through some of the old favorites of this project, the 1176. I'm using the kilohertz compressor, which I don't use all that often. Um, I guess just to compress it more, shape the sound more. If I take this off, if I remember, this did a lot. Oh, yeah, it brings up the tail so much. Um, there's also some volume there, but it's mostly the effect was to bring up the tail. I'm widening this sound a lot. So this might be why I'm pulling in some of the bass sounds from you know, making them uh, less wide is so that stuff like this can live in its place. Um, boosting the highs on this, again, a little bit of dynamic EQ around like 3K. This is where the sound is really punching through the mix. Um, the Mog EQ is another one that I use. Um, I have a, uh, I'm still figuring this out if I love this plugin. I find like I look to the Poltec often. This adds a nice bit of air. That's what it's known for is this air band. Um, I used it here. I find myself going back and forth on this one, on this plugin. Um, but yeah, it's there to add air. I mean, this whole sound is very top endy, very airy. And then we have two different types of side chain here. Um, again, really, really, uh, quick attack, but you let the transient through a little bit with this and then just trimming the ends so that it's, um, you know, if I was to get rid of this, it makes the mix very messy. So I put it on, it tightens everything up. Um, and then we have some ride symbols, um, as well as then a, this is a layer that I guess Neil would have given me. Um, so all of this kind of layers on top of the, the clap sound that I had earlier. Uh, and then we have an anvil. Um, sound. This is the snare. We're trying to find more unique and weird sounds that we can use for a snare, and so this is the anvil sound <laughs> that we're using here. Um, for this anvil sound, if I just play it naked, it sounds like this. Um, see, it's not really, to my ear, it's not poking out of the mix enough. Um, and so I did some weird stuff to it. Um, this is a plugin that I use a lot. It's a it's a Voxengo plugin called Stereo Touch. Really, you should be using this uh, on mono sounds to kind of give them a via a delay some stereo life. Um, I sometimes throw it on stuff like snares because it helps it. It changes the stereo presence of the sound. So if I, that's is with it on. If I take it off. It makes it a lot more mono. And now suddenly, if I take it off again, see with it on, it cuts through so much better in the mix, probably because it's more mono. Um, I have dynamic EQs going on around the areas where the sound is really hitting in the low and low mids. Um, where it's kind of biting through as well as around 2.5K. Um, and then, yeah, this is the main snare sound now. I think I'm also then layering it with this thing, which I've added some of the same processing to so that the sounds are, they sound like they're gelled together. So I've kind of got the same Echo Boy, which by the way, Sound Toys, one of my favorite companies, Echo Boy um, is probably our go-to delay on most stuff. Um, sometimes I find like I have to especially automate the feedback to get it lasting long enough. Um, you have to move it up and down the feedback, but I really love Echo Boy. I highly recommend checking it out. There's a million different like 
types of echo in here. Um, and in this particular case, um, I started with the studio tape and then it looks like I tweaked it a little bit, but um, this is the two sounds together. So that snare just helps to cut through the mix. It's mostly there, but it's lacking that last little bit of bite, which the snare gives it a bit more oomph. And there you go. That is most of the drum. So if I'll, I'll then play the bus together. I have the hats going to a bus. Generally what I do here, I've got a little bit of reverb in this case. It just gives it that air to the, to the hats. You have to be very careful with this. I used to douse my hats in reverb and it would just make my entire mix very muddy. So this is a really, really short reverb. You got to be careful when you add reverb to it, but I think sometimes it helps add life to hats when they're lifeless otherwise. Um, then I'm at, running them through Isotope Trash, which is another one of my favorite distortion plugins. You can get some really gritty stuff out of this. Sometimes this and Decimort are my two go-tos for when I really want to mangle the sound. Um, trash is even more mangly probably because you can get really extreme with it. Um, in this case, I'm just putting a very slight bit of uh, trash on it. Um, and then rolling off the extreme highs over 15K in this track, depending on the tonal balance of the track that I want, sometimes we will ease off of incredibly high hats or incredibly high um, synths, snares, you kind of want to have that gentle roll off around 12 to 15 K onwards. And sometimes that gives space for other noisy type stuff to live, uh, but also makes the track feel warmer and make it feel a little bit more analog, um, which is nice. Uh, and then space modulator, which is going to give a ton of width to everything. So if I take these off, the hats are now incredibly mono, but I've got this at hundred percent. We love this preset, the tight double. It's one of the stock presets. Doublers, tight double, double, double. Um, this is a free plugin, I think, and we use it a lot. Really cool for stereo effects. So with it on, it also, because it works through some sort of flanging and phasing, it actually gives constant movement to stuff, which is really cool. That's a trick that I kind of learned from Estiva. Um, his stuff is always just moving around, and it's really subtle, but it gives life to the track. Um, it's going through some transient shaping. Again, my new tried and true uh, favorite transient shaper, the SPL. And then we have a delay, uh, which I'm trying to figure out what I do here, what I'm doing this for, because I don't remember. It's uh, automated all the way down right now. Oh, I see. It's for transitions. I see. So I bring it up here. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> there you go. It's to just give uh, in these sections where everything filters down, um, it gives some life. So here, I think everything filters down, for example. It gives it some stereo width as if things are building. Um, and then that is going through a drums bus, which, wow, this is the lightest drums bus I think we've ever had. Um, the glue, as I said, I love this on drums. <laughs> Three or four dB of compression, 60%. I love the dry wet on this thing. And again, through a, a transient shaper here via the SPL. All right, so... That is most of the drums. Um, and yeah, at this point, we've done the bulk of the song. Um, the last couple things that I want to touch on are the breakdown sounds and the vocals. <clears throat> so the breakdown is interesting. I've got a couple textures that are playing. Um, these are some of these are from BT's um, textures. I forgot they're called BT. I'll look up the name of it. Um, he has a bunch of different texture packs out there and they're tuned into keys. Uh, sometimes we'll have to transpose them, but we'll find ones that sit really nicely with things. Um, so these two together, if I take them off, 
we lose a lot of air. This gives some movement to everything. I also then have it layered with just, this is a cat from the cashmere pack, but it's just white noise is all it is. And it's stereo. I've added the space modulator with a pretty extreme flanging. So it's just constantly moving around. <clears throat> all of that gives movement to the whole thing. Um, so the base here is different than it was uh, in the other sections, and this is similar to what it is in the uh, original remode. Um, here is just like drones that we have playing to give grit, but then I have, I think by a, I think it's in Trillion, yeah, wow. I don't use Trillion too much nowadays, but for this sound, it's, I wanted it to come through, and we've layered it with the guitar sound too. There you go. So all together, it kind of sounds like a guitar, but it's being a lot of synthesized stuff around it to just give it some grit. If I take off those drone sounds, it kind of loses like the constant grit and warmth, you know? Um, and then the signature thing here really is the pianos, which I need to just find them um, here. So there's this, this is the, I recreated this based on the original, and I actually think I got it really close to what the original sounds like. Um, and back then, it could, it's very possible uh, that Artie used the same sound, and it's good old Nexus, and I've still got Nexus too. It's the grand piano. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm doing to this is I'm adding a lot of spread, which when I listened to the original, I, I could hear the sound was incredibly wide. Um, so if I pull this in, his version or our version sounds a lot more wide to compensate for that additional width i pulled the panning over to the left a little bit because otherwise it would just go so far to the right based on where the keys are playing um and i've got that layered with a synth that's just kind of adding a little bit more body and kind of brightness to the sound but it's pretty subtle really Um, Faturator is another plugin from Kilohertz. Um, I sometimes use it for the distortion stuff, but often I'll use it for the stereo turbo. It's just like a good stereo width tweaker. Um, kind of like the Haas effect. Maybe it is the Haas effect, honestly, which is, um, sound delay, basically. Um, you know, milliseconds of sound delay. Um, and so given the, how wide the original sound is, I needed this to kind of blend with it. And so that's why I've added this width. Um, and then for the piano sound, uh, what I'm doing is this is getting smashed through OTT because it sounded very much like the original was, um, which is, this is like the highest setting maybe I've ever used on an OTT, which is 61%. Um, but if you listen to it without it, it sounds, the sound is far less, um, exciting. It really brings out those higher frequencies. Um, this is just EQ cutting out the lows, all that low end gunk. Transient shaping, bringing up the attack a ton. Again, trying to replicate the sound that he had from the original. And then I'm running it through Camel Crusher just to give him more distortion. It just gives it a bit more balls and brightness. Um, and then Shaper Box, this is, I'm using it as a transient shaper here. See, I'm actually trimming a lot of the tail. It's a really low mix, it's 16%. But this is basically letting this initial part of the transient through and then cutting. Um, so this is probably incredibly subtle. It's all just to give that, the, the attack of the finger on the keys, like this big transient. And then finally some EQ probably to roll off the very lows. Uh, bumping up that that kind of low mid of where the finger's hitting the notes. Um, resonant frequency here, and then just this is the filter that kind of moves up as the track goes along.
All right. Now, finally, um, last musical element to talk about is the vocals. Um, so the interesting thing about our remix is that um, there were no vocals for us to use. Um, and so we couldn't find it. Tanya couldn't find hers. Artie couldn't find them. And so we reached out to Tanya and we were like, well, what if we re-record this song? And of course, the song is like 11 years later. So, you know, her voice has changed. Getting the exact same intonation and enunciation of everything is going to be difficult. Um, but we did our best and we, yeah, we put together basically a recreation of the original using her vocals. So uh, it was a lot of fun to do that. Never had to do that before for a project. So that was actually kind of a cool thing to do. Um, so... Neil often will do some of our vocal processing. He uses Melodyne, I know a ton, and that's why this stem is called uh, Vox New Stem Neil Processed. Um, so he would have done some of the tuning uh, and you know the the uh, comping, etc., of the various takes, um, and then I pull it in, and then I still then do things on my side. There's a ton of automation, as you can see here, a ton of stuff. I'm not going to go through each individual thing because some of it's just like writing levels on certain vocal phrases to just get them sounding balanced. Um, but the general processing on this is EQ, of course, which in this case is actually, this is just for our filtering, which I'm doing because her vocal comes in filtered in the breakdown here. Uh, oh, I'm using, I'm using actually the, the... The UAD mini uh, multi mode, sorry, filter for that actually. Um, here. Um, there's reverb here that is right now automated off. Uh, and then Decimor to give her vocals, uh, which we're probably automating in, just like a little bit of like bite and, and sizzle in the top end, and then trash. Um, this whole track, like the vocals are not supposed to sound super clean in your, like, you know, and gentle. They're supposed to be kind of raw and dirty and like, you know, ballsy. And so that's why we put a lot of like distortion and, and stuff like that on our vocal. Um, and this is also a unique project because Neil worked on the vocals separately to me working on the main project. So some of these stems are things that he sent over. So like he put a, a plate on, on her vocal here. And I just imported it and... Uh, just mess with gain levels on the on these things here, but not nothing crazy. Then we doubled her via vocal synth, which is a really cool pro a plugin. Um, I love this plugin. I believe it's Isotope again. Uh, you can get some really weird effects out of it, and again, we're trying to go for weird on her vocal in this track in a way. So, so some of this is like just giving her like almost like a chorus distorted effect, and then I layer it in. If I take it, if I take it out, it loses some of that like chorusy effect to it. Uh, for the for the chorus itself, we we've got her vocals in an octave up, um, which is kind of wild. <laughs> Sounds like a chipmunk. But the point isn't to hear this. The point is to have it layered and just have it make it feel like there's more grit to her vocal, and. And it kind of cuts through a bit better. Um, and then here we have... I've got this as a bed, which this you will hear, of course, in the main peak section later. But this is just... Uh, yeah, the ever and ever. And we have various reverb sounds here too. Because these are bounced to audio, I don't remember which reverb we used, but there's a good chance we used a combination of Valhalla Vintage Verb. Uh, Ultra Space is another plugin that we use a good bit. And then finally, it's going through a bus. So all of this vocal stuff gets sent to a bus, which at the moment um, is going through the black box again which is saturating, kind of compressing it all together and gluing it together. Some EQ, um, and here is where you see some of those potential notches that might come in later. 
for certain phrases. The this is the Bax EQ uh, from UAD. I think this is also available via Plugin Alliance, I believe. Um, often I'll use this to kind of cut frequencies at a certain point. So like if I want to make sure that there's just a hard cut around 20k, um, or if I want to shell frequencies either up or down a, a marginal amount in a similar way to how I might use the the Poltec or the Mog, um, I use the Bax EQ sometimes on buses. And then finally we have an Imager because of all the sounds that are kind of being layered in together to just kind of gel them together. So giving her a bit more width in the low mids, which is where we added in those chorus sounds and then pulling in everything that's super low. So this is around 220 Hertz and below. Um, so all together, her vocals sound like this. Uh, one last thing is that there are some additional sounds here that I have some delays for like some of those building sections, for example, um, the kilohertz delay I'm using here. There's another delay on the vocals, which is Echo Boy. This is our favorite. Uh, and then a chorus delay thing, which, gosh, I don't remember what this does. Uh, let's see. Oh, just get, it's almost like a slap delay kind of thing. Um, so what this is doing is I've just got, uh, yeah, this echo boy and then I'm running it through the newfangled audio saturate. Um, they have some really great plugins too, newfangled, um, probably as more like a clipper or like a hard distortion sound again, to drive the vocal. That's the goal with this whole thing. Um, and then probably because of the tail of the slap, I wanted to pull that in. So I've got the sustain being pulled down here. Um, and that is the vocal. Um, so when you pull it all together, um, let's find the vocal bus. So I'll play it in the peak section for you now. By the way, there is side chain on this vocal. Um, with everything else bouncing around the kick, it, get, it makes it the whole track feel like it's driving something along. If I mute it, it feels a lot more flat. It is being bypassed for those sections where the um, the sidechain is being bypassed on pretty much everything, including the bass. So just like that, it is, uh, yeah, it's being bypassed. Um, the last thing we'll talk about is uh, the master chain for this project. So I'm looking at this for the first time, um, just like you guys might be. So we'll see what I did. <laughs> um, this is not a shock to me, the BX Digital EQ. This is something that is usually the first insert that I have on a master chain. Um, it can be a variety of things, either a roll off, um, you know, in this case, 21 hertz, that's enabled. Um, you know, you're not hearing anything down there or feeling anything down there. Um, uh, but this has a bit of stereo width on the overall project, which this really just operates like a mid side EQ, this thing here. Um, and it's pretty subtle, 112%. I think I picked this up from a Shapov tutorial that I watched once. And, um, I love this plugin and I actually use it sometimes on buses too, not just on masters. Um, I mentioned that I might have an OTT. Uh, I do have an OTT and it's actually, you know, higher than maybe I'd expect the 12% for a master. Um, it depends on the tonal balance of the track and how I want it to sound. If, it, if it's really rumble heavy and like muffled and I want it to have more bite, but still have the balls of the muffliness, um, OTT is something that I'll sometimes throw on a master. Um, so if I take it off, it actually still sounds pretty rounded and nice here. I don't dislike it without it. So this is probably more of like a stylistic choice of how I want the balance to be. It gives it all a bit more brightness though, and a bit more punch in the low mids. Um, my CPU is struggling. It makes it all a bit more forward in your face. Um, next up, this is the SSLG that I mentioned earlier. I love this plugin and often I'll use them on a master one after one another and they have 
two different purposes. Um, the very first, the one, which is this instance here, um, has a very short attack, one millisecond, or fairly short attack, I should say, um, and a medium release. And the reason for that is to catch any immediate peaks that you hear, um, which then goes into the second SSL, uh, which has a short, or sorry, a longer attack, letting through the transients, um, and a shorter release. And so this kind of like glues the overall sound together. And this one here makes sure that there's no crazy stuff um, peeking through. Then I go to Pro-Q. This looks extreme. It's at most a 3 dB bump. Um, this is a 12 dB setting. I usually have things at 30. So uh, and the scale is important. Um, but what this is doing is I've got a little roll off on all the sub minus 0.6 dB. I've got, again, the dynamic EQ here, which is only 0.33 dB of a, of a bump, um, but this is probably the frequency at which the kick or the sub is, uh, the sub from the kick is really poking through. So this is really aimed at just accentuating the oomph of the kick. Cutting out the, the mids, I found some of our old tracks were very mid-heavy. I've been trying to pay more attention to this mid uh, to this mid-range recently, um, usually around 400 to 700 hertz. Um, things kind of get a little bit gunky. Um, and then for the hats, I added this dynamic EQ. Let me turn it off real quick so you can hear. It makes a pretty substantial difference in how the cats come through. This is off. And now this is on. All right, <clears throat> moving on to the linear EQ low band. Um, this plugin, I don't use it all the time, but when I do use it, it's often um, for trying to clean up things in, in around the sub area. It's a linear phase EQ, so I'm using that to avoid phasing issues by EQing the sub too much. Um, it looks like in the end it was really subtle. Sometimes I'll go a bit more drastic than this. Um, but I'm just doing a small cut at 65 hertz. Standard clip is one of my new favorites that I found out about um, I don't know, a year ago or so. And I've been using it a lot on hat buses, drum buses, um, but also on masters so that I can drive the final limiter a little bit harder. Um, it is a hard clipper and I make sure you, it's really important to use the hard clip uh, mode, which I just disabled. Oops. Um, <clears throat> and so what that does is it allows you to drive things through it. And in this case, nothing is hitting it here. My computer's struggling again, sorry. I may have put this as like a precautionary thing, or I may have just messed with the, uh, let me see if I can, I may have just messed with it when I switched the hard clip setting back. <laughs> Uh, and forth, but basically it just clips things a little bit so that you can actually it cuts off the peaks so that you can drive the limiter harder so the limiter is not reacting to those like very short peaks that you have often coming through transients etc. And then um, the last two plugins that are actually important here are uh, Imager, which again all this is doing this is pretty subtle uh, because it's not really touching the mid range at all in this you know in this track. It's monoing everything below 110 hertz or so. Really important. Um, you can do this a million different ways. I've recently started using the Ozone Imager to do this. Um, and then I'm pulling in the very top end a little bit as well. When I find when the white noise stuff is too spread out at the high ends, it's really distracting for the ear. So I pulled it in a little bit. And then I'm running that through Invisible Limiter, which is uh, my limiter of choice. I also sometimes use the newfangled Elevate. Um, but I like the invisible limiter a lot. Um, and it lets me drive things pretty hard. Um, sometimes I have to mess with the mode to kind of find the one that sounds the best for the track. Um, in this case, I went for modern four, but it, this actually might vary depending on what the song is. And, um, again, the balance of the song. Um, and so that is the full mastering chain in terms of what's impacting the sound. I then have, uh, the producer's favorite. Uh, spectrograph, I guess, um, Voxango Span. I referenced this a ton while making the song um, and also when then finally looking at the master at the end, both for its RMS value stuff 
Um, there's other plugins that do that part too specifically, but also for the tonal balance of the track. Um, and then one last plugin, which I think is kind of cool to talk about is Listen To. Um, it's called by Audio Movers. It requires a subscription, but Neil and I don't live you know, next door to each other. And in fact, now I live in Portland. He lives in San Francisco. Um, so we work on music remotely all the time. So what this allows us to do is it basically has a live audio feed. Um, so I'll be able to, I throw this on the master, I log in and I can stream the audio in real time in high fidelity to Neil. And we can sit on a Zoom call and we can talk about it together. Um, we tried so many different ways of doing this, you know, screen sharing, audio, whatever, a million different ways of doing this. But this is actually like, incredibly high fidelity. He can hear the mix down as I hear it. And we can talk about little finicky things, even working remotely from one another. Um, so this is a really cool plugin. And if you collaborate with people a lot, um, highly recommend it. Um, we started using it about a year ago when we were doing production walkthroughs for people in our discord. And um, now we've turned it into something that we use a lot uh, when we work together. So that is most of the project. I think we've covered all of the big stuff. I've been talking a lot. Um, again, hopefully you found this useful. <clears throat> There's no right or wrong way of doing anything. That's the thing that I kind of learn every single day. Um, I find favorite plugins that I'll use on something for a little while, and then I won't use them for a while. And then I remember that they exist again and I start using them again. Um, there's no right or wrong way to make a record really. It's just how, you know, how your creativity jives and flows with the, the various stuff you're using. And, um, yeah, just keep trying to learn. And I learn stuff every single day that hopefully makes the next record a little bit better than the, uh, previous one. So I hope you found this interesting and exciting. Thank you guys for watching and, uh, yeah, go check out our remix. The full track is out now. Take care.